Welcome, welcome, welcome to Whole Book Approach with Picture Books. I've been looking forward to this one when I was in the classroom and I taught middle school and high school. I use picture books all the time. So I'm looking forward to this and I'm looking forward to Jane. If you don't know Jane, you don't know life. All right, so I'm looking forward to Jane giving us this presentation today. Who am I, you may say? Well, I'm Dr. Desiree Alexander. Hello. I'm the founder CEO of Educator Alexander Consultant. I'm the executive director for the Transformative Educational Leadership Certification Program in Louisiana. And I am the deputy director for the Associated Professional Educators of Louisiana. Now you can leave. You know everything you need to know. No, just kidding. These are all the different ways that you can contact me. If you are joining us on the YouTube channel, no, you cannot get a certificate, but you can get the knowledge. And right underneath the video in the description, you will see the resource for today. So definitely go ahead and grab that. If you're joining us live, what's up, party people? We're about to have some fun. All right. September 28th, Cultivating Thriving Teenagers, practical, not just everyday SEL strategies, but practical SEL strategies for the classrooms. And definitely come and join us and have that conversation and talk it out. We are currently um, recruiting and getting webinars. I think we have two that's already in the pipeline for the fall. So I'm going to tell you in a second how you can let us know what you want to learn and if you want to present. But we always have our self-paced courses going on. So definitely, if you need SLLA, Educational Leadership Test Prep, Google, Certification Level 1, Level 2, Support Time, we just need to talk to me about, I don't know, something. You can uh, always get all of those on our self-paced classes. This is where you can come to tell us what do you want to learn and what do you want to teach. So if you're like, hey, I, I'm brand new to webinars and presenting, but I want to throw my hat in the ring, great. If you're like, hey, I'm an international presenter, presenting every day, I want to do it for EA webinars, great. Either one, either way. Or you can just tell me, hey, I would really like to see a webinar on this topic. So let us know. You can register for the webinar we already have. We have about two more coming down the pipeline right now. And then we have all of these little links or we'll all be at edalex.net slash events. Woo, all right. Dun, 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 dun. We're going to get what we came here for and learn about the whole book approach using picture books. Great. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. And um, folks that are listening, the reason I'm providing this today is during COVID, I discovered Dr. Alexander and just learned so much from so many of her guests and from her herself that just this past spring, I decided it was time to just give a little bit back. So today's topic is the joy of reading picture books with children. And that emphasis on with, it's not to children, it's with. So today we're going to go a little bit deeper into using an approach called the whole book approach. All your materials are going to provide it, will be provided at the end of this book creator with links to everything you will need. So my suggestion would be just to kind of sit back and just indulge right now in this time of just enjoying the picture book as an art form and everything it has to offer to you as a reader of words, illustrations, and design. And my hope for you is that this session might generate some new learning, some strategies, maybe terminology. It will ignite a spark. So if you do have some thoughts that come to you, those little spark of ideas of something you're connecting to, just jot those down so you don't lose them. Hopefully it's gonna expand your go-to list of picture books and it will connect to the science of reading these strategies. And lastly, again, just a time of refreshment. I know it's a Saturday morning. I just started school this past week. So this is meant to be a time to just refresh and enjoy. All right, so as a librarian, of course, we have to begin with a story. So what led me to this approach? Well, I was 24 years old, married, had just become a mom. It was 1985. I had been an accountant and, and stayed home to be a full-time mom and just fell in love with picture books because we spent hours upon hours upon hours in the public library. So much so that we lived in a town that was uh, really close. We lived on the border, so very close to the next town. Not only was one public library story time enough for us, we would join the second library. So when I had just my son, David, who my grandson, Jack, is listening, so that's your daddy, we would go to uh, library sessions in both libraries. My daughter, Laura, is in the picture, who's now 35. When I was expecting Laura, I went to a story time session with David on a Thursday, gave birth on a Friday, 
And the following Thursday, God forbid, if we would miss a story time, my mother came down, babysat this brand new six day old baby so that I could take David to story time. That whole experience led me to go to graduate school and earn my master's in library science. That was 1997. It really wasn't anything prior to becoming a mom that was on the radar. So I just think what a gift becoming a mother was that led me to this really a lifetime passion. So when we think about this presentation, it's really been decades in the works. So knowing that I had read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books before even knowing anything about the whole book approach, I had come across a quote by Dr. Uh, Rosenblatt. She was a, a professor at NYU in the mid 1900s and definitely a pioneer in reading theory. And I remember at the time just loving what she had to say. The books don't simply happen to people, people happen to books. So there's this transactional experience that happens that the text is playing this role in forming meaning. But if we add to that also the beauty of picture books, it's not only the text, but it's those illustrations as well that are having that transactional experience between us. And I thought, what a powerful, powerful thing books can be to individuals, regardless of age. So fast forward now to 2014. So keep in mind, I've been a certified school librarian practicing to, since 1997. So we're talking 17 years of practice and feeling pretty competent. Um, I had a chance to go to a weekend long uh, program, professional development at the Eric Call Museum, but they were hosting it at the neatest setting in Pennsylvania through the Highlights Foundation. And in that experience, the whole pro process was to teach us how to read picture books with children, not to children, how to get away from it being like a performance story time versus a constructive opportunity for children to sit alongside you and create meaning. So years earlier, uh, probably just a couple of years actually before this date, one of the museum directors, educator rather, uh, Megan Lambert, had really started processing through this and she decided that it made the most sense since picture books are a form of art to use those same visual thinking strategies that you use when you visit an art museum. And she began testing that out with her story times at the Eric Hall and then ended up creating that book called Reading Picture Books to Children. So that experience for that weekend retreat really was tr beyond transformative. And I've never looked back at how I've experienced children's picture books since that time. And you can see in the pictures, what a joy to have met Floyd Cooper, who has since passed and to sit side by side with him at dinner time, and Vera Williams also just, you know, groundbreaking individuals in the field of children's literature. So this book, if it's a book that you don't own and you want to go deeper, I'd highly recommend purchasing it. Again, the whole book approaches this co-constructing interactive story time that uses picture books as a form of art. And the biggest emphasis is that you're reading with the child as opposed to them. Visual thinking strategies. Any art museum you go to when you walk around with an uh, educator, they'll always stop at a piece of art and they'll ask you pretty much these three pointed questions. What's going on in this picture or this piece of art? What makes you say it? And what more can you find? And again, these strategies now incorporated into reading picture books are gonna make it more of an inquiry-based engagement with children because now we're really studying the art as well as the text and also looking at the design. A picture book with text alone isn't the full story. And I'll often tell our children, if we can read that picture book with the word solely and then look at it with the pictures and learn nothing new, then it really isn't that great of a picture book because there should be this whole new meaning that we're discovering through the art. I just wanted to share just quickly, because one of the suggestions I'll make at the end is that you know, you host a session for parents and teach some of these aspects. And if you just scan through this list, you'll see for the last two years, I've, I've been in one particular school and ran this session each year and have returning parents coming to it because they want to learn about new books. But they're all highly educated um, individuals, avid readers, and they all say the same thing that I've heard over and over and over again since I've learned this process is that they never knew any of this. It opened up their minds to absorbing books in, a, in its truest sense. And they learned that the individual aspects of a book jacket and end papers, what great value they add. I love the comment that one parent said, I finally know how to read a book for the first time. I have a dad of a first grader now who came when I ran this and, and when his child was in pre-K. And every time I see him, he tells me it totally transformed their sharing of books before bedtime. 
um, deliberately choosing books. They're seeing the children writing more and using the, the tactics that they're learning from these wonderful artists. Kids being critics, they have an eye now to look for these features and choose only the best when they're choosing books. I just did a session on the very last day of school for my current faculty, which is the worst time to actually to give PD or probably to have to receive it. But I have to tell you, these teachers were just blown away, veteran teachers. They all learned something new. They couldn't believe how much you do need to linger over the artwork, especially the cover first. They had never paid attention to end pages. They're learning terminology that they want to share with their students. They can't wait to go back and look at their own collections again. They know now how they can push student thinking. I think one of the biggest things is it's given people permission to slow down the read aloud. Many of the teachers who are also parents said they can't wait to use this at home as well. So if we look at this page here, um, I want to ask you maybe if you want to type in the chat, one of these um, terms or thoughts that you see on the screen, just go ahead and type it in the chat that really jumps out at you. Is it the critical thinking piece that you can see might happen using this approach? I love the fact that we value children's thinking because we're doing this together, that there's open-ended questions, again, permission to slow down, that we meet children in the pages of the books. I recently listened to Katie Camillo giving an interview and she said this one line that has just stood with me since then, that she said, Read al reading aloud with children is an act of love. So the whole, to, uh, whole book approach is another toolkit, another tool in your toolkit for you. Again, we're going to be looking at how we're centering children's ideas, their questions, and fostering critical thinking. Okay, the whole book approach, again, those three big questions. What do you see happening in this illustration? These are vis visual thinking questions. What do you see that makes you say that? That's providing evidence. That's a cornerstone of critical thinking. What else can you find? That's when you're pushing the group to go deeper. That's also causing collaborative meaning making, which is so important for everyone to feel they belong, that they have input to provide, that they're essential to the class. This is an inquiry approach. And it very much makes me think of when we use primary sources with any age group, how this is the same process that we pour over as we try to develop meaning. All right, so let's start at the beginning. The first thing we notice with the book is its trim size and the orientation, meaning the actual cut of the book, the final product, what is its size going to be? The three main sizes are portrait, so that would be vertical, landscape, it's horizontal, or a square shape. The publisher is very intentional. It's usually the publisher who's going to make that final decision on which of those orientations best fits the story. When we think of portrait, Again, vertical, and these are terms you would use with the students and you'll hear them repeating them back. It's typically a story about a person so or something that would have height. So if you were doing the Empire State Building, obviously you would have to have it be portrait or vertical. People, we, we stand vertically, so that makes sense. Horizontal or landscape has that feeling of movement. You'll see typically those stories about a journey of some sort. And then square it has real purpose. So one of the things you might think of when we look at John Steptoe's Baby Says, it's all about a brother, an older brother building blocks. Blocks are a square shape, the perfect square, a square. So you'll start to see that that makes sense. Anything outside of those three would be called non-standard, and it would really have to be huge of a reason for the publisher to print something that's not a standard format because it's very expensive. So when we, again, we look at the trim size, the first thing we might do is say to show two different books, one that's horizontal, one that's portrait, one that's landscape, and say to the children, what do you notice about these two books? Why do you think one is tall? Again, using the terminology, vertical. Why is one more wide or horizontal or landscape? And you might explain the very first time that theory about that sense of movement and try to draw some of that thinking out of the children. Again, we see portrait, you might ask, why is this book so tall when the other one is so wide? And we just mentioned about the journey, the action. If you need that sense of movement, you're gonna to wanna to have that landscape. I thought this was kind of cool to see though. If you look at the difference between a vertical portrait and landscape, when you do a double spread illustration, look how much more room the illustrator is gonna to have to, for length when the book is open to full spread. So that also probably weighs in on the decision-making from the publisher and, and the actual artistic designer at the publishing house. 
Now, all these pieces we're looking at today, you would probably introduce maybe one in the first session. Maybe you'd incorporate a couple of pieces on the second time. The process is not meant to like beat the book to death. It's to help create meaning. So you as the teacher who's specifically and intentionally previewing and noting all these things as a reader yourself are going to pinpoint which ones are most essential for that first reading. Now, as a classroom teacher, you're going to have the luxury of going back and revisiting books many times over the course of the week. They might be pieces you keep for those revisits. For me as a librarian, I really have that one, one period a week. So I kind of go full force into the whole thing. For those of you who have not seen this new book, this is a perfect one for when we're introducing orientation, landscape versus um, portrait. It's called Giraffe is Too Tall for This Book. And what you'll find in it is he starts to complain that he's never fully in the book because it's landscape. So then they have the bright idea, well, why don't we turn the book and make it vertical? And then Elephant says, but I'm too wide. And it kind of ends with that humor of, all right, how are we going to do this? The second piece that we look at is called the book jacket. So that's the actual jacket that's protecting the book itself with that cover illustration. Years ago, I worked at a school that the librarian would take all the book jackets off and only put books on the shelf without them. And you're gonna see why that's really detrimental to creating full meaning because the book jacket illustration may have a totally different illustration than what we find on the board cover. So let's just talk a little bit about the different types of art you'll see on the cover. You might have what we call a wraparound illustration. So it's the illustration spreads from the front cover right over to the back cover. You might see that it's full bleed, meaning the, co the colors go all the way off the page. You might have the illustration surrounded by negative space, which would be like a white space. It might be framed. Or you might see the front cover has a different illustration than the back cover. So we would call that a dual image. You might again see the full bleed, maybe a spotlight picture, again, some negative space of framing. But then the third kind that we notice is a wraparound image, or it could be a dual, either one, but there'll be an author's message on the back or a quote or a snippet. So we're going to look at some of those in particular right now. The biggest thing you want to remember is when we're analyzing these pieces, children are predicting, they're analyzing, they're interpreting, they're inferring, they're collaborating with each other, again, for the purpose of creating meaning together. So the biggest thing teachers are really learning now is just to take that moment and to linger over the cover art. So I would show the, just the front cover by itself in the picture. I opened it up so you can see that this is dual image. There's two different pictures here on the cover, but you'd first look and just ask what's going on in this picture. What makes you say that? That's getting them to point to the evidence. What more can you find? And then you'll notice on the back, there was a little message. Uh, Thank you is for hands to hold. So we would talk about the back cover being a dual image, but with some kind of author's message that we'd wanna hold in our thought as we read this book. After you're finished with the story, you might wanna go revisit that book jacket art and ask again, how did this represent the book as a whole? Now, one tip I give classroom teachers is you might wanna use just this piece alone at the end of a day to pique interest for tomorrow's read aloud. There's a great activity called Tabletop Twitter where you might photocopy that. Maybe, maybe one group has the front cover and another group has the back cover. And you put that photocopy illustration on a big sheet of paper and the kids gather around a table and they start writing what they notice. So everyone has input and then do a little gallery walk. So it's a great tease in the classroom of what's to come tomorrow. You could also send that home to parents, have them do that activity with their children prior to tomorrow's lesson, which is a great way to have that homeschool connection. All right, so think of book jackets again. That's like that coming attraction poster. That's what's drawing students to choose books off the shelf. So again, we might say something like, how did that wraparound cover pull you in as a reader? What is grabbing your attention? And what information does the jacket give us about the story? Again, especially if it has some kind of little quotation mark there, or even if it signifies that there is an award-winning author that has created this book, all those pieces are important. I just want to show you a few more. So wraparound cover, again, look at the front, open up the book and say, wow, look, this is a wraparound picture. On a future time, it would be the students that would probably be giving you that feedback. Again, those same questions, what do you discover? And again, why do you think the wraparound worked well for this? There's certain books that you'll see that it needed the flow of many people, like take your octopus to school day. You needed to see that whole parade of children. The friendship ship, not necessarily maybe, or the goldfish on vacation, 
kids are very surprised when we open it up and see that there's more than just those children on the front cover. This book is just exquisite. Um, Lucy Ruth Cummings works for a publisher first. She still may be an artistic designer, but she may solely be illustrating picture books. But when you look just at that front cover and that zoomed in, there's so much emotion that you can feel that little girl has for her little friend, Truman. So you would just show that and just ask the children those same three questions. What do you notice? What makes you say that? What else can you find? Notice it's landscape. So we might say to them, um, this is gonna signify there's some kind of journey in the story. And then when you open it up, you see it's a full wraparound image. We see the whole girl, that whole body language. Nell plants a tree. This is like one of my top five new books from last year. Absolutely adore this book. You're going to see it's portrait. So we have that vertical, a tree. Makes sense. You're not going to see it as landscape. Again, it's a wraparound illustration, but you may say to the children, or is it dual? Because there's some different shading of colors. It would be a fun debate for them to see and dig a little closer in provide evidence for their opinions. You'd want them to notice the authors' names, illustrator names, placement of all the different texts, especially in the title, and then the characters that they see. So they're preparing their brain, building up some evidence for the story that we're about to read. Dolly 1.0, again, one of my favorites from a few years back. We looked at the front cover, analyzed that. And then when we looked at the back cover, we really pause and linger over that message. Building a friendship is hard work. And that would be a point where I'd have students turn and talk. Do they think that's true? And how is that true? And for some children, they may say, I don't, I don't find that. And they might give us tips of how it is that you can maintain friendships so well. And again, this is a portrait. So it's about, gonna be more about a person. We might notice that there's only one name, author and illustrator is the role Shanda McCloskey played in this book. And I often talk to the children about how hard in some ways it must be for that person to determine what are they gonna tell through words and what are they gonna show us through illustrations? Oh my goodness, Sophie Blackall, she's just probably the master of illustrating. So if we look at farmhouse, it's actually in the shape of a square which makes sense because you think of houses, probably that very firm, solid structure. This is a wraparound cover illustration. And we notice the words under her name, two-time Caldecott medalist. And that might be something I would bring up to the students that they're not aware of what that is. If they don't know, then we would talk about how, how prestigious it is to win it once, never mind twice. And the award is given to the best illustrated book from the previous year that tells us we are in for a beautifully magnificent piece of art. I love this one too, Jack Wong, When You Can Swim. And one of the things I, I would like to see the kids kind of pull out, and if not, I might prompt them a little bit, is the word choice in the title. It's not when you can swim or if you can swim or when you swim, just the emphasis of that word when you can swim. And we might kind of start making predictions of what might that tell us about where the story is going. Again, this is landscape. Okay, so it's horizontal. It is a wraparound because we see the water continue. And then there's sort of that teaser line that kind of invites us into the story plot. So there's examples of some dual images. Dual images are so much fun because you're going to start to try to piece together. Why are these two images or how can they possibly be connected and stop formulating again, predictions for that. Hot Dog was the Caldecott winner two years ago. It was perfect choice. And if you look at this cover, you really want the children to feel the sense of movement of the air, the breeze, the happiness of the dog. What is he carrying in his mouth? Again, noticing the medal that he won, maybe time of day. And then when we go to the back cover, we say, wait a minute, this is a dual image. It's a separate separate image completely. It's not a bleed to the edges. It's this little spotlight of him looking out the window. And again, a fan, something blowing air. We see Sophie Blackhall, who we just saw with Farmhouse, making a comment about this book that's an utter joy from beginning to end. So we want to make sure we're noticing all these things and now I'm trying to make sense of those two images. The reader Lauren Castillo, again, another magnificent illustrator. This is a dual image. And again, that short text that's leading us and pulling us in, a boy, a dog, and a snowy day. And I love the front cover. We see the, them all dressed up and the way she's kind of 
pulling him along. There's a suitcase. What's in that suitcase backpack? But then the back cover, the boy and his dog cuddled up. It's the end of the day. This might be something where you might see children thinking, oh, we're going to be going from the beginning of the day. Maybe he's following her, him to school to the end of the day where they're reunited. So kids will make predictions of what they think. That could be something right there that you could stop and have them go off and do a quick write. Again, Sophie Blackhall with, with um, Hello Lighthouse had to be portrait. You need that verticalness. And notice the back cover is what we call a cutaway. So when we're looking at the front cover illustration, we see the external nature of the lighthouse and then the back cover. Now we're getting the glimpse inside. John Agi wrote The Wall in the Middle of the Book. He was one of a few people who have really been taking advantage, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, of the gutter, the center of the book. Um, this book, again, is portrait, so it's about people or a person, the character, the wall in the middle, and again, one full wraparound image. All right, my favorite piece, well, maybe second favorite, is what we call the undies, to look underneath that book jacket at what's called the case cover or the board cover art. There'll be a whole new illustration if you're lucky underneath. Sometimes the cover illustration is replicated. It's worth the peek. As a librarian, what I tend to do is I don't tape those book jackets on completely on one side so that we can easily peel it off and see what's underneath because you're missing out on some fabulous art if the kids can't fully access that illustration. A few years ago, um, an illustrator and a librarian, I believe, started the Undies Award. So if you click on the image, you'll get to see the past books that won for various uh, reasons for the art for case covers. And there's a few years worth. Those are really fun to look at. Of course, the kids love saying undies. So when you pull off that book jacket, look at the difference. The top image here is the book jacket. And then underneath is what's on that case cover. So two totally different scenarios. So now you have much more art for the students to examine what delights them, what's the reveal. Sometimes we'll count down three, two, one, reveal when we pull off the book jacket. What new learning are they gaining from that extra art? What is their eye leading them towards? Hot dog that we looked at a few minutes ago has, well, this is an ooh and an ah when we pull off this cover because look at this inside. Now all of a sudden we're starting to get some new information. See what the children can pull out of that. We see some sounds. We see what looks like um, crosswalk. There's that pizza, the seagull. And what is that woman saying with that dog right there? So kids will start to make lots of inferences. This is a beautiful book out of a jar about dealing with emotions. And when you take off the book jacket, look at that piece of art there. Have the children start maybe thinking about what do those different jars represent? What about the colors? What do they signify? And this might be one that you're going to come to after you read the story again, because now they'll have the full meaning of the story to go back and understand why is that there. Watermelon seed was uh, Greg Pizzoli, perfect sense that he would make the outside of a watermelon. Um, it would probably be a disappointment if he didn't, because we would expect that. He's excellent on always illustrating a separate image on the board cover. And that's a cost a full bleed. So that gives you the sense that the watermelon is continuing. It's a large watermelon because the colors are going right off the page. The Ice Cream Vanishes, uh, Julia Sacon Roach, also author illustrator. So she shows you really four different scenes. So the top is the book jacket and the bottom is the board cover. What new information are we gaining? What do we notice? How are these pictures connected? What might it inform us for the reading of the story? This one I thought was a real delight. Uh, this is again, Greg Pozzoli, Good Night Owl. So the top is the book jacket. And then the bottom is what we find underneath. Now, students may not be familiar with what a sampler is, that piece of needle craft. So a fun activity preceding this book might be, if you can get your hands on one, having it just at a table for like discovery and having kids you know, touch it and feel it, examine it, pose questions about it. Then when you turn to that uh, book uh, board cover illustration, they're going to have some background knowledge about it, especially the front and the back, if they really can textually touch that. Um, Jumper was a really great narrative nonfiction this year. And just look at the difference between the front cover and then that zoomed in back cover. Everything else is removed, but this up close of the spider. And again, notice the colors. He's bleeding off the page, which means the spider is bigger than we think because we're so zoomed in on that picture. 
this book is absolutely lovely and it belongs, I think, in everybody's home called Beneath. Um, I have an interview link at the end. I interviewed the author in March. So I want to make sure that you have a chance because you get to hear her talk about being both author and illustrator. And this is one where you really don't want to rush this process. So this might be in the classroom, just an exercise that you do day one and then come back to the next day and just revisit the thoughts and then dig into the story because those two images are so powerful, such different emotions that we see. And the children might start noticing who's missing, who's there, what time period is it? Why is he hiding under a blanket? There's gonna be a lot of questions that won't be answered until we read the story. Uh, Ryan T. Higgins, he, he never disappoints. He always illustrates um, underneath the book jacket. And again, look at that face of Mother Bruce. Another Sophie. Sophie's wonderful on doing those cutaways. So when we took off the book jacket of Farmhouse, just look underneath. This is a book when I read it from to kindergarten all the way through that many times in the story, we would go back to that case cover illustration to really see in closely into those rooms because her details are exquisite. It's something you definitely don't want to miss out on. And again, that meaning making that's happening throughout the story by going back and using that piece of art. So if we pause for a second and think about what child development experts say, how children learn best, that they, to, they need to feel safe, learning needs to be joyful and fun, they need to feel like they belong. And I really believe using this whole book approach does create that kind of environment. There's an excitement in the air when we're digging through because we're working together, everybody's voice is heard. And it's a safe environment because there's no wrong answers because we're interpreting. And that's that transactional theory piece of, of literature that the author and illustrator are not always telling you exactly what the meaning is. It's up to us with our own experiences to bring something to it. So I just, I just think it's wonderful to have that joyful experience with books. Again, slowing down and examining it piece by piece and thinking the skills are there. So we think of the science of reading, we're learning vocabulary, we're predicting, correcting our predictions, we're inferring, we're questioning. Again, that collaborative nature, we're using clues, we're holding multiple pieces of information in our brains at a time. And again, as I stated earlier, you know, you could definitely use these as a tease for what's to come by just doing those pieces that we've done so far. I said to you, the case cover, peeking under the book jacket is my favorite, but actually my favorite piece is end papers. So when we open up the book, the first pages that are glued to the board cover is what's called end papers. It's the beginning and the back, that full double spread. It's kind of a funny term because it's in the beginning and the back. It's really like an overture of what's to come. And what's really cool about illustrated end papers, it's gonna draw our attention to uh, some certain element of the story. It could be the character, maybe setting, might be something about the plot. When they're not illustrated and it's plain white paper, we are beyond disappointed. Many times when I'm choosing books nowadays, um, if I can physically touch the books, I'm looking for these components first because I wanna have the richest experience with the picture book as a form of art. And I want as many of these components there as I can find. I have asked illustrators um, how come they don't always illustrate end papers. And typically typically they say they, they just run out of time because of a deadline because they do realize it's, real estate, like they want to take advantage of every piece of paper they have. So this is what you'll see with end papers. Solid color sometimes that changes, maybe from the beginning end paper to the back, or maybe it stays the same. You might see patterns of color. Again, they might change from front to back. They might be illustrated, but the same illustration on the front end papers in the back, or they might change. Those are the best ones. So let's just look at a couple examples. This was from Mother Bruce. And if you look at like the lighting on this and the smoke coming out of the chimney, this is setting the scene for the story. So you've already examined the book jacket, the board cover, art, and now this. This is that overture. Just now you can't wait to turn the page and dig in. The colors are bleeding to the edges of the paper, which means you feel that sense that you are standing in that scene with them. I'm not going to keep repeating those um, questions, the visual thinking questions, because you're going to do as many of that as you can on each point. I just want to get through as many of these images as I can show you. This was that giraffe again. So this was kind of cool. So the end papers had the giraffe depicted through the pattern and the end papers in the back of the book is the pattern from the elephant. So that would be an example of highlighting the characters where Mother Bruce, we just saw, was really highlighting setting. This is the book called How to Santa Go Down the Chimney. This is a must buy too. Just read. 
I would have thought John Klassen might have illustrated, but there's a simplicity in this book that makes sense. And the kids we might say, why did they choose red for this? I thought they're all going to say Santa's suit. A piece of cake was one I did a few years ago. And I feel like the color in this case actually highlights the central message. And it took, I would say it was on our awards list. So I had probably read this to about 12 kindergarten, first grade, second grade classes before a little kindergartner was the one to make sense of that color. And there's no right or wrong because she was able to attach meaning. And she said, the reason they use that turquoise color is it's, it's the color of the platter. That cake that was going to be meant to be celebrated with the whole community of those little forest animals was the central theme of the story. It makes perfect sense from the mouth of babes. Sandcastles, this is one where you might see uh, end papers that indicate passage of time. So the beginning ones, we can see it looks like, you know, morning, and then the end, we see daylight. So I'll say to the children, in that case, it's between the pages of the book that we're going to go through this passage of time. So basically, it looks like we're going to go spend a day at the beach. And we've linked those with, again, the cover illustration. Okay, another one here, that's Mother Bruce. Again, look at the end papers changed at the end. So we see now this book is indicating through end papers, there's going to be a change of setting. There's some passage of time. Even mood seems different. This was the story about the uh, ice cream vanishes. Look how different those end papers are. Kids have a lot of fun with the top one. Everyone, you know, turn and talk. What's your favorite ice cream treat you're going to choose there? And then fun to see little animals all sneaking away with different treats. It might reveal an aspect of the plot. There's the wall in the middle again. And this is one that you would be um, just critically, again, examining each piece. To, um, our goal is to make sense of those parts in the totality. This would be one way you might also want to look at the information on the book jacket flap, because it might tell you something that would also be important to use. I don't use it every time, but when there is something there that makes sense to incorporate as a tease or to give more insight, take advantage of using it. So every aspect of the book has some component to create deeper meaning. Uh, Sophie Blackall, she's one that many times her back end papers are really the back matter, that additional information to learn more. So that would be something that depending on the age group, when I worked with fifth graders, we might begin with that. And I might photocopy that back matter and have them go off with a partner and do some annotating of what they're reading come back to the group with what they learned, what they're still wondering, what's confusing, but they're then bringing some background knowledge to the story where the front end papers are really kind of showing us more like primary sources. We're seeing the real photograph, we're seeing some articles, we're seeing an, a note there. Hot dog, we looked at already the board cover and the book jacket, but then look at the end papers. At first glance, you think they're exactly the same, but they colored, or he did, Doug Salati colored the dog in a different pose. So that makes our eyes go to that. So we might say that to the children. Why is only one of the dogs, I mean, one image of the dog in movement. Why did he choose that one on the front versus the back? And then you might figure that out through the reading of the story. So that's always fun to go back to at the end. Farmhouse, again, this is a case where she always does Sophie Blackall, that back matter. We see primary source images there. And then the front is like collage piece. So it's tying into the type of art. So it's preparing our brain to say, this artwork might indicate the, the media that she uses, which is a, a collage approach. I, I put a video here that you might wanna read, uh, watch yourself just to gain some more background knowledge. It could be something you could share with your parents. It's Sophie herself talking about this book. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper. Something good. So we would look at this book jacket only just the cover, and we might ask those questions. Why do you think this book was designed in portrait layout? What are you noticing that's telling that? Do the colors evoke any feeling? Do we recognize the author or the illustrator's name? And then we would look at the complete book jacket. What do you notice again? What's grabbing your attention? What, what are you seeing on the back cover that's different? Because this is a dual image. And what about the words? The bad something has no place here. What does that mean? Something good, notice even the font style. We take the book jacket off and we see a whole nother piece of art. What do you notice here? Who's present? Who's missing? How does this connect to what we just saw on the front cover? What is it on the book jacket? What does it make us wonder? What are we gleaning from this new art? And then we go to end paper. So this is the beginning end paper. Wow. Sometimes we do a drum roll first before we reveal it. What is this all about? This seems so different from everything we've seen so far. 
What are they noticing? What's connecting to the art they've seen? And then the back end papers. Now this might be one too that somebody might notice the dedication. Like I put it on this page. And that might give us another clue as well to all the good somethings in my life, especially Rick, Lily, and Wit. And you might also then read the book jacket flap. If you feel it's important before reading the whole story, include it. If you don't think it's important or you, you want that to be more of a mystery, then you hold off on that piece. Three little mittens I was just showing you to just see again patterns of color and how they would then connect to the different mittens. Very cute story. Don't be afraid to sit with the silence because that's the sound of thinking. And that's an important piece of the whole book approach is that collective constructing of meaning. And that takes time. We need to be good listeners. We need to try to add on to someone else's thinking. We need to be respectful when we disagree with what we see. It's just a wonderful opportunity to build really effective collegial conversation. And children need to learn that. I'm going to skip over this. This is something you can look at later. Just gives you the terminology for everything that's in what we call the front matter of the book before the text actually begins. When the text begins, that's called the book proper. And that's when you're going to see those different kinds of layouts. The one piece I want to show you, though, is the gutter, because I found this one to be the most fascinating piece. So the gutter, as far as new information, the gutter is what, what's holding the book together. Usually it's stitched in the gutter. And the artists have to be so careful what they put in the gutter because it gets pinched in when it's sewn or glued in. So they have to be super careful that it doesn't get distorted. One of the things you'll notice is the left side of the paper is called the verso. The right side is called the recto. Where things are positioned are going to draw your eye to that. So we want to always keep that in mind. It might be the kind of thing that I would begin if I was a classroom teacher is pointing out this gutter, pointing out a full spread like this image here, and then sending kids off either to the library or to the classroom and letting them find one, put a post note, bring it back and start having small group discussions. of what are they seeing? What are they noticing? Can they come up with a theory about the use of gutter? Because John Steptoe did something marvelous. It's an older book. He has since deceased. He was considered really just groundbreaking in his uh, design of art as a late teenager when, when his first book was published. But he really showed that the left side, the verso side, seemed to show power and stability where the right side of the gutter, the recto side of the paper, the recto, which is what the paper is called on the right, was more the more um, vulnerable position. And I'm gonna show you a few cases where you can see that. When we look in the baby says, you'll see the brother is in the vulnerable side on the right side of the book, building a tower. And the little baby is on the left side. He's in the position of power because he's starting to climb out of his, at the time, a crib or a playpen. So very interesting use of gutter. We see it here with this full spread from Dolly 1.0. The position of power, the left side, is that dog because he's stealing away her new toy. And this is interesting how well uh, Shanda McCloskey was able to show the little girl running across the page, right? Our eyes are moving right across with her as that sense of movement. Uh, when Elephants Come Home this is a beautiful book. It's based on a true story. And again, it's about elephants that were in a dangerous spot in Africa, and eventually were placed in a sanctuary. So we that theory of power and vulnerability, power being on the left and vulnerability, vulnerability be on the right, we can definitely see in this image as well. So even for older students, that might be something to talk about with them. Okay, so I'm just going to flip through these. Um, Peter Reynolds, he tends to use design art, what we call vignettes. So these little snapshots that are very loosely defined edges, and we might talk about it with the children. Why do you think he does it that way and we don't see the full spread all the way to the edges of the paper? Why is it always surrounded by white or what we call negative space? D does it give us a different feeling? Does it evoke something different from us? Do the colors indicate certain emotions? Typography is an artistic choice both author illustrated together with their artistic director will make an, on the design and layout of text. So we might look at this one, Charlotte's head was always in the cloud, tinkering, toggling, coding, downloading. We might talk about that. They may incorporate that students in their own writing. How do you want to show fun kinds of movement or pacing through typography? Again, speech bubbles is an artistic choice. Panels are probably some of my favorites because it's showing what they call simultaneous succession. We're going to see this rapid movement to show motion over time. So things that are going to happen 
sequentially really quickly, you'll always see as a panel and you'll tend to read it in that kind of voice. Back matter is everything they'll find when the book ends. That's when you'll find a glossary, list of contributors about the author, all that kind of information. I'm not gonna have you put anything in the chat just for the sake of time right now, because I wanna be able to just remind you again that this approach is not meant to be used as a way of killing the joy of reading. It's just a way of inviting new, richer, deeper interpretations. No one knows their students best beyond you. So you would be pinpointing exactly what features in a particular book you wanna highlight most in that session. And remember, if we think big picture, how does this transfer? If we're using picture books, how is it going to transfer to our second and third grade readers who are using those early chapter books or our middle grade novels or even high school novels? Well, by analyzing a book in this format, you're recognizing and noticing nuances, subtleties. You're paying very close attention to setting and character and those subtle changes along the way. You're identifying character traits through many times images. You're having to adjust your predictions. You're holding several ideas or details in your brain at the same time, which is so critical when students move into novels. You're doing a lot of inferencing work. You're making meaning by putting the pots together into a whole. You're looking at a, you're noticing theme. It really is that close reading. Home connection ideas. So many times I'll provide parents a, a, um, a handout in the beginning of the year and I put a sample letter right on the top right for you to see, explaining what terminology I just introduced that week with the whole book approach and possibly in a, like an extension activity they can do at home. Sometimes I'll photocopy end papers that change and I'll say, tell them to have their child explain to them what happened, what took them from point A to point B using those end papers as the point A and point B, and it helps the children to retell because they can keep going back to those. I would include websites for, for parents to go deeper with authors, any kind of author interviews. You might want to front load a lesson. Maybe before you teach a lesson, it's something in the back matter, a letter from the author, more details about what you're about to delve into. November is picture book month. It's a wonderful time to run a session for your parents. You could do it in person. You could do it on Zoom. You could do it as a recorded. I've done this now maybe six or seven times for parents and you'll get repeat uh, parents coming to it because they want to see like the newest. They want to be reinforced again. They really get excited. There's always one or two that will just come up and like hug me because they're just so moved by the passion that, you know, that we do bring to the table for, for their children and for working with them on this beautiful type of art. Um, newsletter I do for teachers. I put a little snippet on the right where I always highlight two or three new books each week. And I'll make sure I note, note within my description, those particular features, those components that are especially uh, wonderful in those particular books to say, don't forget, peek under the book jacket, look at the end papers. In this case, use the back matter. All right, handouts. What I've given you is on the left side here, this is kind of cut into a bookmark shape. What I would do is either alone, with a buddy, it's always good to read the book first, read it with someone else and start noting all the things you notice and just fill out that little thing and stick it in your book. So you always have sort of that quick reference of those things that you noticed. The right side is a little more detail about um, a couple of QR codes that take you to a list of books that have excellent art in um, undies, which is the board cover illustration, as well as the end papers. It reminds you again of some of those visual thinking questions. Conversation starters. So I did this for each type of element, and you'll see what you would say, what you could ask. And again, I'm not going to do all of these with every book. I'm going to pick and choose the ones that are going to help us to develop the greatest deepest meaning from that engagement with the book. But these are good for you to just have as a reference. Um, on the left side, you'll have a, a document that shows some of the books that we use today. And then on the right side, last year, I made a commitment to myself to start interviewing authors and recording them and sharing those with students and sharing those with parents. And they're actually posted on um, teachingbooks.net as well. So I gave you a the QR code to take you to those. I think it's about six interviews I've started so far because I really wanted to get the backstories. And I think that's so important. The more rich information we can provide for children, the greater level of engagement and appreciation for this art. So learning about authors and illustrators, what can you do? Visit websites, use that teachingbooks.net, listen to the acceptance speeches from ALA Awards Banquet. That's fabulous to listen to, especially the Caldecott winners. Participate if you do not in World Read Aloud Day because there's hundreds of authors and illustrators that provide a free 20 minute Zoom session on that day. And that's when we get to ask all those pointed questions and learn some of those inside secrets about, about the illustrations or the text. 
Um, a few years after Megan wrote that first book, she did write one called Read It Again, The 70 Whole Book Approach Plans to Help You Get Started. And she did 10 books for each grade. So I believe she does from kindergarten through, I want to say, sixth grade. And if you're feeling like I'm not sure where to begin, this is a great scaffolded place to start. That book is also available digitally or in print. Now, low cost books. One thing I wanna show you is there's a, a place called bookoutlet.com. It's on the left. If you click on that link, you can get $5 off your first order. When I went on it just two days ago to see some of my favorites that we're talking about today are in there. Nell Plants a Tree is a, absolutely, you need to own this book. It's only $7.64 hardcover. I have bought one to put aside for my grandson. I did the same with Hot Dog, which is a Caldecott winner. Uh, Lauren Castillo's books, Nan in the City, Nan in the Country, they're outstanding. And look at those prices. So I love to support my local independent bookstore, but there are times when we have a very limited budget at school. And um, that's a great resource for you to have. So Book Outlet is the sister company to Book Depot, which is an institutional account. The prices are a little bit cheaper for the same books in Book Depot, but you have to apply as a school. And shipping is usually free when you only spend, I don't know, $35 or so, so not bad. Just this morning, I found this bulk bookstore. So this is when you, like we did this year, we gave every teacher a copy of Nell Plants a Tree. And if you buy 25 copies of a book, the price goes substantially down. So I noticed today on their site, they had Mac Barnett's How Does Santa Go Down the Chimney? To only $10. It's usually like $19.99. They're brand new, hardcover. But the, the requirement is 25 books. All right, so falling in love with picture books, my little grandson Jack was listening in the beginning, and there's nothing that has brought me greater joy than to see his book collection growing, his attention to books, and his parents, in that case, is my son, but his mom, Caitlin, is the most wonderful person and mother in the world. It's just a reminder, it's never too late or never too early to get started reading with children. Is my contact information. If you ever want to just get together on a Zoom and work through a book, I'm happy to do anything to support you. So Desiree, back to you. That was simply amazing. Like just thank you so much, not only for the practical, like exactly almost step by step what to do when you're looking at a picture book to really create that love of reading before you even get to the story, but then to give resources and where to get started. We have some really great comments in the um, in the chat I want to point out, um, I like to use Book Creator in class. I often put a picture of the student who read the story on the back cover, and I put a problematic problematic question in the bubble, keeps the students in suspense until the end, and they are very interested in what the book cover will look like. Um, collaborating with a sense of belonging. Yes, I love that. You asked a question at the beginning about like what things they were um, doing, and it was interactive story, modeling, critical thinking, co-create meaning. Um, yes, reading with children is an act of love. I know one thing I said is I love reading with children versus two children. I really, really love that. Um, engaging students before the story even starts. The scholars giving feedback is so important. Uh, we had Sophie Blackall for an author visit this year. She's amazing. Um, that's good, having scholars to look at the color and talk about the emotions they evoke. That's powerful when looking at a book jacket. Um, so even more, like, oh, like it just keeps going. Um, we do have a question. Uh, no, that's I can answer that. So no, um, thank yous. This is fabulous. All that kind of stuff is coming up in the, in the chat. So just a huge thank you for everything that you brought to us today. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. And um, if people want to do a, an advanced class where we just really narrow in on one or two books and spend the whole time just with that one text, let, let Dr. Alexander know and we can work out something. Love it.